Hi everyone, welcome today. Thank you to the Linden Department of Parks and Recreation for hosting this topic. Take a look, closer look at managing lower vision from an occupational therapy perspective. To reach out to the Linden Department of Parks and Recreation, please call 908-474-8600 to learn more about these programs. My name is Michelle Hedegar. I am an occupational therapist and a program director with Aristocare Health Services. We're right in your backyard at Aristocare at Del Air. And today I'm going to be talking from an occupational therapy perspective, how you can uh, manage low vision and how to detect low vision um, when you're at home. So today's conversation, I'll be talking about what are the components that make up vision. Oftentimes we think of um, the eye chart and all those things that um, you're getting your screenings for, but there's a lot more that goes into that. There are normal changes that occur after the age of 45 and significantly after the age of 65 to your vision that are normal parts of aging. And then what are some of the typical conditions or um, problems that occur that are not typical to aging process? I'll be talking about, um, from a low vision perspective, those common conditions as such as macular degeneration, glycoma, diabetic retinopathy, as well as cataracts. I'll also talk about how an occupational therapist can help, whether it's in a short-term rehabilitation stay at our um, Del Air facility, or whether it's at, in your home, or whether it's an out in an outpatient clinic, or even in some doctor's offices, they may have an occupational therapist who specializes in low vision. I'll also talk about some general things you can do to make your life easier um, in your home to keep yourself safe and also to make, help you function in your daily life. And those are some environmental strategies. And I'll be talking about some low vision resources, um, techniques and tools, some that are more on the low cost end, others that are on, on a higher cost end, and then how you can um, find resources, whether it be through the internet or for your local community. So let's talk a little bit about the basic components of vision. The basic um, is visual acuity. That's how we see how sharp something looks. That is always detected by the Snellen chart. Most of us are familiar with the eye chart. From a very early age, even when we were in elementary school, the nurse or um, a physician tested our acuity on the eye chart. The Snellen chart is based on fractions, so you'll commonly hear I'm 20, 20, 20, 30, et cetera, et cetera. That basically is your ability to detect the sharpness of an image or that um, size of the letter on that Snellen visual acuity chart. Um, that's gonna be able to see how far and how, how, what the size of that object is. Visual field. Visual field is that I can actually see something coming at me at the side. I can see my hand waving. Um, right now, I can't see my thumb, but I can see all the way up to my middle finger waving, right? So your visual field is how you see from the sides vertically and also horizontally, how I can see something coming from here and then something coming from lower. It's our complete range of vision, far left, far right, um, up and down. Um, without turning our head and eyes. So sometimes you've probably had this screen for um, in your, um, visual, your typical visual checks where someone had you follow a pen with your eyes and follow a pen with your eyes down. That's a great um, just basic screening that people do as well. Um, the, that is, is measuring your central and your peripheral vision is what it's um, considered doing. Normally, that's 150 degrees horizontally. So if we think of right angles, your 90 degree angles, and also 120 degrees vertically. Contrast sensitivity is another component of vision. That is your ability to see the foreground from the background. Well, what does foreground and background mean? That means an example of that is being able to see like a white plate, like your kitchen plate on a cream tablecloth, or being able to see um, maybe uh, like a paper clip, clip on, um, on a busy um, tile floor. Okay, so it's being able to see that object or that item, which is the foreground from that background. Um, that is really critical, especially with reading. And, you know, certainly if things have higher contrast, we know that we see those better. So something that's black on something that's white, we're going to be able to see that easier than something that has similar tones or with similar busy patterns. 
Glare sensitivity. A glare sensitivity is another component of vision, and that is the ability to regulate and control the glare. So we often, as we age, it gets harder. So you may notice that when you're driving, you have glare sensitivity at night because you have the lights coming at you, or maybe it's even the glare on the TV that you can't see the TV as much when the sun's coming in through the window. Um, that changes as we get older. So we're going to walk through a series of these type of, of eye problems or conditions that are not typical um, after we kind of discuss a little further what is typical changes in the vision or during that normal aging process. So now with some of the normal changes, as I mentioned in the components of vision, are presbyopia. How many times have you heard, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm over the age of, you know, 40s now, I'm in my mid-40s, and I need bifocals. Or you start taking the paper and you're holding the paper out to kind of see it, and you're adjusting. Typically over the age of um, mid-40s, like 45, you start seeing changes in that. That's presbyopia. That's the difficulty of being able to see those objects closer to you, okay, often termed farsightedness. It does tend to worsen from that mid-range of 40s to 65. Um, and then at that point, it kind of levels off from a normal aging process. Basically, what's happening with the normal loss is that you're starting to get hardening of the lens of the eye. And that's what's causing that issue. And that's usually typically normal. Lots of people naturally compensate. Maybe they get a pair of readers um, or uh, magnifying kind of glasses in the Dollar Tree, or um, they purchase them somewhere, they get some cute ones, or they start just holding things out and then going back and forth. If the person typically had glasses for nearsightedness, those individuals may then go to like a bifocal or a progressive lens or that type of thing, especially if they typically see their eye doctor on a regular basis. So that would be considered normal. Um, that wouldn't necessarily be something to be alarmed about. Other things with um, not just from the acuity standpoint, which affects the presbyopia, but also we have that peripheral vision. That's what I talked about, that fields, the fields of vision that we can see these things outside of not just when I'm looking um, center, not just what it's in front of me. Peripheral um, vision loss can be common around the edges. So what we tend to see as we get older is that 150 degrees that I mentioned you can see out, that starts to come in. So you'll start seeing that where before, as I said, at this point, and just to give you, give you a perspective, I'm in my mid-40s, um, so give you a perspective, I can kind of see that beginning to start to see that fourth finger, right? So that's considered normal fetal vision. So what's gonna start happening is it's gonna take a little bit longer before I see that object on the sides. Same thing for here, it's gonna take a little bit longer till I start seeing it. So as you, as you age, that is gonna, that window is gonna start shrinking. So if you think of like a square, and if you take it with your fingers right now, and you hold it out in front of you, make a square with your fingers, you can kind of see where that is to take a look. So that square is narrowing and it's also shortening. So that, that field of vision is coming closer, okay? That is normal with typical aging. Um, by the time you reach your 70s and 80s, you're gonna have 20 to 30 degrees um, less um, peripheral vision on all sides. Um, it's, at that point, it starts becoming necessary for you to compensate. So you're turning your head side to side more, looking up and down more um, to be able to do that. So you're using your neck as well to turn to be able to kind of see as, a, as, a, as that window of vision starts to shrink. Reduce pupil size. So the pupils is like the black of your eyes. Um, it's an adjustable opening in the center of your eye that basically adjusts. So when you get your eyes dilated or if, um, or if you go to, um, you go and you have some flashes of light in your eyes, your eye, your, that center of your eye, you have that dilation um, effect. And with that, it allows your eyes to get a, a, a degree, a specific varying degrees of light into the eye to enter the eye. The muscles that control the pupil size as well as their reaction um, to the light, so that reflex in some in, in common terms, starts to lose strength as you age. So that causes the pupils to become smaller and sometimes less responsive to changes in light. So if you're going from a, like a light contrast this room to a brighter room or to a darker room, you'll sometimes see, and especially when you go from light to dark, you'll see, oh, it's, it's gonna take me a minute I just, my eyes have to adjust. So that time that it takes for your eyes to adjust 
lengthens as you get a little bit older. That's just a common way to understand that. Um, seniors in general over the age of 65 need three times more ambient light um, for comfortable reading and, and, and than they did in their 20s. So as you get a little bit older, you're gonna need more lighting to be able to see a little bit better um, with the changes in that pupil size and that reaction time as well. So we start seeing those changes in acuity with um, the, the farsightedness or being able to read closer. You start seeing that visual field changes slightly. You might see a little bit of narrowing of the window that you can see. And then also you have that pupil size. The other thing that's impacted with normal aging is glare sensitivity. So glare sensitivity is, um, you think about common areas where you see glare. Uh, oftentimes when there's fluorescent lighting, so fluorescent lighting in, let's say, stores, uh, common stores that I always think about um, are like, you know, your um, wholesale clubs um, or like your Walmarts or those type of things that have the overhead fluorescent lighting. Oftentimes there's a lot of glare in those environments, which definitely you're more sensitive to that. You may experience like a slight headache after going in those type of environments because of the glare from the fluorescent lighting to the to usually oftentimes a lighter um, tiled uh, or vinyl flooring. Also direct sunlight. So you go outside on a bright sunny day or let's say this past winter when we had a lot of snow, you have that bright light reflecting off of that white um, snow and we had that for a period of a good month that there was snow on the ground. That is that glare or that contrast could also be difficult. Um, reflections. So reflections off of smooth surfaces is another where, place where you're going to see glare. Um, so newly waxed floors, um, even um, cars or cars coming towards you, you get that reflection of the sun while you're driving on a bright summer day is going to cause that as well. Some of the things um, with that, with as you age, is you're more likely to have difficulty adjusting to that again. So every kind of almost along the way, you start to ha requiring extra time to be ad to adjust to these glare or the light sensitivities, basically to, to say it that way. Um, so if you come into a dimly lit room and you know from a bright outside or those kinds of things, you might feel like you have that sensation of that glare. Also, computer monitors can have glare, your TV. Um, so some of the common things, which we'll talk about a little towards the end, is how to accommodate for those. So if you have like your TV positioned in your living room or your computer on your desk, think about where your window is in position to that. So maybe you can't move your TV, but can you um, put, a, put a set of blinds up in that window that you can adjust so that you're able to still get light in when you need light because we, we, I just told you a few minutes ago, you need more light to be able to read. Um, and you know, obviously natural light is fantastic for that. But when you're watching TV, that glare on that TV, you don't need. So being able to adjust or having adjustable blinds will then decrease that glare on that. So those are some of the simple things that are very common and easy to do that we may not think of to reduce that glare sensitivity. So the next thing I'm going to talk about, we talked about what's common with aging. So if you're experiencing any of those, there's just things you can, simple things you can do to adjust your daily life. And, and I'll talk about those towards the end of, the, of this presentation. But what I want you to think about is if you have other things that are affecting you with your vision that don't seem to be related to the things I talked about. Then you're going to really want to make sure that you're seeking um, an ophthalmologist to have um, your regular checkups and things like that, which you should be doing anyway. Even if you're someone who said, oh, I've had perfect vision my whole life. I could have been a pilot. Um, <laughs> it doesn't really matter. You need to make sure, especially as you get a little bit older, definitely, certainly, um, you know, at that point when you're in your mid forties, um, start getting your baseline and getting those checked on a regular basis because the eye can experience some changes that are not considered normal. And there are typical conditions that um, are more problematic that you can certainly treat, seek treatment for. And as I mentioned, those which we'll discuss about are things like macular degeneration, glycoma, which glycoma is very treatable and um, catching that early is significant, um, cataracts, as well as diabetic retinopathy if you are a diabetic. So we're going to talk about those a little bit. You know, those are things that, you know, most often are not necessarily fixable with a pair of eyeglasses um, and, or, or, you know, an easy quick fix. And those would put you in kind of that low vision category. So that's going, you're not necessarily, you might not necessarily be considered blind or legally blind, but you would be considered low vision. 
So with low vision, oftentimes we start seeing signs of problems in those areas. So not the typical aging. You may have trouble distinguishing colors. Um, and that's not due to necessarily, maybe you've had color blindness since you were a child, you were identified as being colorblind. It's beyond that. So it's now that I may have different, a typical different, dif difficulty, excuse me, differentiating between like red and purple. Uh, but I'd never had that problem in the past. So difficulty identifying those colors. Reading. Um, maybe the words appear distorted or broken. As you read a sentence, maybe you're missing an incomplete word in the middle of the sentence. Or, you, or a long word like um, experienced or supercalifragilistic. That's a really nice long word. Um, you're missing parts of the word. That would not be considered normal aging. Distinguishing objects, being able to identify um, what the difference is between um, objects. Recognizing faces, if you're starting to see that you're having difficulty recognizing faces. So if someone's coming into, um, if you're in a store and you every day, you know, regularly go into your local Dunkin' Donuts, and Mary is always working that, that same shift, so you're used to seeing Mary, but um, when you go up to the counter, you see her, you're not sure if that's Mary anymore until she says her, her voice, um, until she talks to you. Um, so you're having trouble distinguishing those faces. Um, other things, so, such as seeing objects um, like curbs, thresholds, that's a change also in like depth perception. So the ability to see the depth of things. If you notice you're more often um, tripping like on curbs or sidewalks or on stairs and you, it's not, doesn't appear to be necessarily a, a physical or a muscular change or a vestibular, like a head related change, but um, you're noticing that you're not catching those changes visually, that, um, that there was something in, in your um, path that could be considered a, a problem to seek out help. Or if you're having any difficulty with um, you know, writing, reading, those type of typical things. So one of those conditions is macular degeneration. It is the leading cause of blindness in the United States. Um, the macula por portion of the eye is responsible for your central vision. So that's the center of your vision. So changes in the central vision um, affect your ability to see the detail. What happens with macular degeneration, which makes sense degeneration, is that they start to degenerate or deteriorate um, the certain cells in the macula. As I mentioned, that's responsible for your center vision. So what happens is when that is damaged, if you were looking at like through a lens today, um, what we see is this, if we see a picture, let's say we see a picture, um, and this is the picture of, let's say, um, a street corner or a picture of your family. What starts happening is in the very center of your picture, because I don't have diagrams for me today to show you, you start seeing a blackening or a part of it is just not there in the center. So it starts very clearly in the center and then you can just kind of see the edges of that picture or the view in front of you. Um, as the macula um, damaged area starts becoming affected, you will start seeing, it might start showing up with something very as simple as, oh, I didn't catch something in the center. But then as it starts gradually expanding as the macula deteriorates, you, it will seem like those images are, or the, of those objects in the center of your vision are either fading or they're slowly disappearing. It can be very scary. Um, you know, straight lines and edges start seeming like they're wavy. They're not as um, distinct. The cause of macular degeneration is uncertain. Um, we just know that as it deteriorates, um, it causes that central vision loss. So that peripheral vision, all this around you that I talked about earlier, is still intact, but that center is where it's greatly affected. So glaucoma, glaucoma. A lot, a lot of us get tested for glaucoma regularly. That's when they poof that air into your eye. Um, when you're at the eye doctor, they put your eye up and they, they, you get that burst of air in the center. That's testing for built up pressure in the eye. Um, glaucoma is a result of that build up pressure. And if it is detected early enough, it can be controlled. So that's why it's, it's, it's tested very early on with your regular um, vision checkups that you get on a yearly basis. 
what is happening is actually there's damage to that can cause that leads to damage in the optic nerve. Um, this is also can lead to vision loss and blindness. Um, early on, it's only subtle changes you'll start realizing, and most of the time it's with contrast. It's that contrast between those objects and their backgrounds. So we talked about that foreground and background. So you may have difficulty being able to distinguish the curb from the sidewalk or from the street, especially if um, they're very close in color. Um, you may start missing steps on staircases because you're not realizing the, the dip, unless there is a, a differentiating factor such as like a, a strip of um, tape or something on the step, you, you have difficulty doing that. And then oftentimes um, with glaucoma, you'll start feeling, not a sense of feeling comfortable driving at night um, because you're losing that contrast. Um, most people are not aware of when they start having glaucoma, so that's why that regular screenings are so significant for that. There are three types of glaucoma. I'm only going to talk today about the primary type of glaucoma because it's the most common um, in older adults. Open angle is the most common type of primary glaucoma. Um, it's detected early on through routine eye examinations. Um, that can, that's when their eye drainage actually becomes, the canals become clogged over time, which then increases your inner eye pressure because um, not, not enough fluid can um, drain from the eye. The other type is closed angle and that is characterized by more severe pain. So certainly if you have any pain in your eye, even if it isn't related to coma, definitely seek out your ophthalmologist to make sure to see what's going on. You shouldn't really normally have eye pain. Um, but closed angle is, is typically there's severe eye pain. There's also blurred vision. Um, it's that eye pressure um, increases very quickly. So then that's causing that issue. And it because those canals, as I mentioned, also then have difficulty draining and become, can become blocked. So glycoma is a little bit different than macular degeneration. In macular degeneration, we talk that you have that center field loss. So if I'm looking at an image, that center portion is what starts becoming blacked out or, or fading away or disappearing. With glaucoma, you have the opposite, where you start seeing more of the blackness or the fading around. So if I was looking at a picture of my family, let's say, um, and you know, pic pictures are typically like a four by six is like a, a square. Um, and I was looking at that in front, a rectangle in front of me. The round, the, I would only kind of see the, actually the opposite of macular degeneration, but I only really start seeing the center because I start losing that vision around. Um, whereas with macular degeneration, I lose the center of the vision. Um, so you're getting that loss of that peripheral vision. So all these things around you start, the world starts closing in because of that um, higher eye pressure or glaucoma. The other typical condition that happens um, oftentimes, and even, even myself um, have had a cataract in the past, is um, especially um, very common at over 50, is cataracts. They are a normal part of aging. Unfortunately, um, they're one of the, the biggest issues why people start having issues with acuity, or remember that acuity is that visually, vis ability to see the sharpness. When you look at that Snellen chart, again, that eye chart, you start seeing that you're not able to see necessarily which line, your lines become worse. Oftentimes, that is because of the cataracts. Um, so cataracts actually are a, cloud in it, a clouding or um, kind of they start, to, it starts to create like a blurriness, um, almost thinking of like putting Vaseline over a pair of glasses and then putting them on, okay? Um, that's kind of what looking out of a cataract eye, depending on um, how far along you are with your cataract, um, is becoming. It becomes a clouding of the lens of the eye. Light no longer can get in, and the light is so important because we can't see without that light. Um, we can't, it, it becomes very difficult to be able to um, see the sharpness and the detail that is needed in our daily lives. So as the, the cloudening of that lens occurs, that light no longer passes in easily, and the vision becomes hazy, becomes blurred. Um, and cataract surgery is the most common uh, treatment for that, and it is um, treatable where they'll go in and re they replace that entire lens. So they take that lens out, put a new lens in, and all of a sudden you have perfect vision <laughs> in most cases, and it can be restored. Um, so again, cataracts, just that cloudiness of the overall picture that I was looking at. Um, as we mentioned, glaucoma is that peripheral vision loss, and then the macular degeneration is that central vision loss, or that center part of that picture I start having trouble with. 
The last is diabetic retinopathy. That is really specific to those who have diabetes. Um, diabetes oftentimes, um, if people are not getting normal blood work done, is undetected in older adults, so certainly you should be getting your regular well visits, even if you're someone who doesn't have any typical conditions. Um, so with diabetic retinopathy, it's when the diabetes itself, actually the condition leads to damaging of those tiny vessels of the retina. So re diabetic retinopathy, that retina. Um, those damaged blood vessels actually start to begin to leak into part of the retina that allows us to see detail, see the specific precision that you can see when you look. Um, if it continues and it's not untreated, it can lead to um, blindness as well. Um, am I scaring you enough? <laughs> you got it. That's why it's so important that we see our, our um, eye doctor on a regular basis to make sure that we're being preventative in our, in our, um, in our care of our eyes. Because oftentimes you don't realize you have this slow issue growing until it's too late. So regular eye exams are very important with individuals with diabetes. Um, I feel that any older adult, a, a regular eye exam is essential to, to keep you on the baseline. Um, if they can detect diabetic retinopathy early and it can be treated, that vision loss can be prevented, which is really critical. Um, but oftentimes they find that most um, people do not um, seek out regular visits and 50% of people with diabetic retinopathy, it's too, it's too late to be able to reverse those effects. So, um, so it's really important that you, that you have that done. Some of the treatment options they have with diabetic ret retinopathy is just a simple laser treatment. It, it is not very invasive. It doesn't hurt, and it can be done most of the times in the doctor's eye, eye, eye office, the doctor's, doctor's office. Um, so now that we've talked about what's typical aging, what's not typical, um, the four common conditions, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how occupational therapy can help. If you've had occupational therapy in the past, oftentimes maybe you had a hip replacement, you think about the occupational therapist being somebody who can help you with um, learning how to, to dress, use so that you don't bend forward, um, being able to do simple meal preparation in your home. Um, so you may have not had that impact, influence with an occupational therapist when it comes to low vision. One of the benefits of um, occupational therapy is that they can look at your daily function and the things that you do. They understand the way that the eye works and how that affects your daily living in your life. So they can look at your home environment and the tasks that you do and think about um, how can this be adapted or how I think we're just kind of like the adaptation machine. We are the individuals that can certainly um, help you be able to modify what you do so that it works for you. Based on your based on your limitations and based also on your abilities, um, we often look at things that what 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 ability do you have left with your with your vision so that we can make sure that you can do those things like writing checks for yourself to pay your bills. Um, maybe you're someone who loves to sew, so um, sewing has become difficult to, because just being able to see the needle and thread. There are a lot of adaptations that can be done. We can also help with um, identifying those assistive devices, so the things that, that you may not even be aware of that um, either can be fabricated and made by someone you know or something that you can even purchase for yourself. Um, and also teach some basic compensatory strategies or um, techniques to do things just a little bit different in your daily life that make it a lot easier for you to be able to see things. So let's talk a little bit about that. I'm gonna give you an example of kind of what a simple environmental modification is. Um, I talked about how with general aging, um, oftentimes you start seeing issues with the contrast, um, specifically like with stairs. So simple things like um, having um, an edge on stairs or putting in a railing and things like that to be able to do that. So if I had a picture of stairs in front of you and those were um, all like the stairs I'm looking at actually right now in this room, they're all a brown color. Um, they're, they're the same color throughout. It's very hard to distinguish in those stairs that I just came down the difference um, between one stair to the next. So changing um, stair treads, an example of that is if you have um, wood, cement, um, even um, like steel stairs on the outside of your home or inside of your home, um, oftentimes is you can have your stair treads be different colors. So having a wood stair tread with like a white 
um, contrast will help a little bit, but then um, maybe that's not an option for you. Um, so maybe you have rugs and you love your rugs, that's fine, but rugs are all one color. So making sure that maybe you put a little piece of uh, contrasting tape on the edge of your um, stairs. Those are simple home modifications that you can do, and that's an example of something. So let's talk about simple things you can do. Clutter is always an issue. So if you're having visual problems and you're having trouble distinguishing things, the more clutter you have, the harder it is it's going to be able to find something um, when, with using your eyes. So a simple thing is reducing clutter, reducing um, the amount of cords that you have, um, you know, things that um, you know, typically can be in the way. Also, um, placing your furniture in specific ways can help you too make a difference in what you're, in what you're doing. So let's talk a little bit about the glare. So lights, glare, and action. So what are some of the things that you can do in your home to make it safer? As I mentioned a little bit earlier when I was talking about glare, it could be as simple as just arranging your furniture to reduce that glare on your televisions and computer monitors. Maybe if you're looking straight on, but um, my couch is here, so I'm sitting on my couch watching TV, TV's in front of you, but I have my front window. Um, that front window may produce that glare. So maybe moving my favorite chair on an angle so it's not that direct glare from the window. Putting up um, blinds that you can change the lighting um, as your task changes. So maybe you wanna sit in that favorite chair um, and when you're reading, you want the extra light. So opening the blinds and then certainly closing the blinds when you're gonna watch TV so that you don't have that glare. Um, so adjustable window coverings, adjusting those furniture, using adjustable flex arm or gooseneck. So this is not a goose, this is a gooseneck microphone. Um, so that gives you an idea what a gooseneck um, lamp would be. So it's adjustable. So that can be turned different ways depending when you need brighter lights and when you need more concentrate lights. Um, oftentimes just having that light over the piece of paper that you're reading and being able to see that, that will increase um, the ability to see the contrast as well as um, potentially, as, you're, as, you, as you know, um, you know, and strengthen that ability to be able to see what you're seeing. Dim, dimmer switches can be very helpful. So if you don't have a dimmer switch in your home, if you have a handy um, family member to be able to put one in, the dimmer switch can be very helpful, especially when it comes to glare and depending on the tasks that you're doing. Oftentimes, years ago, we used to only put dimmer switches like in our formal dining rooms, but dimmer switches in every room, especially with overhead lighting, can be very helpful. And they're also very cost effective. Um, using switch plates. Um, your switch plates can be difficult to see. So using a colored switch plate against a wall, or if your wall is painted a darker color, using a white switch plate can help you see that difference. Especially in the evening, as, as it gets darker outside, there's less light in the house coming in naturally, it's important for you to be able to identify those switchers quickly. Having um, those switches on timers helps too, um, to make sure that you're coming home to a well-lit home um, from the outside is very valuable because you don't, that coming in from the outside, walking in, you know, you want to be able to have some kind of lighting when you, when you walk over the threshold into your home. Glow in the dark night switches are very popular. They're popular with little kids. Um, I know um, my daughter thought it was like the coolest thing when she was at Home Depot with me and saw they had glow in the dark lights <laughs> switches. But they can be also very popular with adults. So having the switch, so the switch glows in the dark, um, just gives you the ability to be able to see it when entering the room. If you have darker um, lampshades because that was your decor, consider putting on a white or a lighter, lighter color lampshade because that'll be able to, that bulb will be able to become brighter. And that enhances the maximum light being able to shine through. Nowadays, there's so many different bulb options. If you've gone to Lowe's or Home Depot, or even to Walmart or Target and go down the aisle for light bulbs, um, you can become very overwhelmed because there are so many different types of lights. So certainly having a daylight bulb is probably your best option um, if, that, if that helps you out. Um, some of the lower contrast bulbs that have more of that warmer, kind of that um, yellowish kind of lighting, those are difficult because then you're not gonna have the brightness that you need to be able to read or even in like your kitchen to be able to, um, to see what you're cutting and things like that with meal preparation. If you have trouble distinguishing colors and that's important to you in your life, there is a thing called Color Star. 
Keller Star is a handheld um, Keller identifier um, that you can use for all different kinds of purposes, and it's a device that also will help you, and that's called Keller Star. Uh, stairways, hallways, and steps. Those can be very dangerous areas as you get a little bit older. Um, you want to make sure those stairways are well lit, um, especially from the top or um, the bottom landings to see those thresholds. You can easily keep a flashlight in a convenient location. So let's say you do your laundry in the basement. So before you go down there, um, maybe your light is not at the top of the stairs um, or at the bottom of the stairs. Um, I know for myself, um, I don't actually have a light at the top of my stairs, so I do have a light at the bottom of the stairs. So you want to think about, do you have lighting on both at the top and the bottom? If you don't, then you may want to have a, um, then you might not, half of your stairs may have good illumination, half of them may not. So you may want to keep a flashlight with you. Um, you know, certainly having a cell phone that has a flashlight is also helpful. Um, the nice thing about that is if you're not even in your home, you know, we often forget um, that most smartphones, so whether you have a, um, as long as you don't have that old school flip phone, if you have a smartphone nowadays, they do have a flashlight feature. Um, or you can get a flashlight app on your um, phone to be able to use the flashlight. And that can be very um, helpful with um, navigating like darker curved surfaces that you're not used to. It also helps in restaurants when you can't read the menu. Um, so that's something to think about too. Um, marking the edge of the first and the last steps um, with some bright paint or light reflecting tape can help as well. Um, using non-pattern, um, brightly colored runners um, to mark walking areas. So oftentimes as an occupational therapist, I don't recommend using throw rugs because we can trip on them very easily in our home. But if you need ability to be able to identify distinguishing services, maybe you have a split level home where you have a, a threshold from your kitchen to maybe your um, main living room space, you know, and you don't, you don't want to put that reflective tape on that step. You could always have a runner that goes to that um, space so you know when that runner ends is where that step goes down. Just some way to cue yourself. Always keeping things um, clutter free again, that helps with, with those type of hazards. Handrails. Um, sometimes handrails, if you have handrails in different areas, making sure that they're a contrasting color um, from the wall to the handrail is very important too, so that you're able to, um, to use those. My opinion is, unless you're carrying lots of things, which then is another whole dangerous hazard, I would always use your handrails when going down steps. I know I do it, I've fallen down a couple steps myself. So um, you want to make sure you hold on to the handrail as you go up and down. Um, other types of things um, that you want to think about is nighttime. So keeping things like your remote controls in the same space. So if you're having difficulty with contrast and being able to identify or locate things in your environment, um, again, if you're starting to have that, um, if you have glaucoma and you have the peripheral loss, macular degeneration, and you have central vision loss, or even just have normal aging and difficulty with contrast or finding things, you want to keep your remote, your reading glasses, um, your medications, things like that in a common area. Um, it goes a long way being habitual and being neat, um, to be honest with you. So if you're organized and you always put things back in the same area, you'll have a lot easier time of finding those. Um, so keeping a bedside caddy, a lot of people do that. If there's somebody who's, you know, in the evening watches TV, um, you can attach, they have ones that can attach to your mattress, you keep it on a nightstand. I think it's very important um, having a traditional nightstand with a light that you can turn on when you need to, when you get out of bed and when you go get, get into bed, certainly. You can use things like Ziploc type bags or ice cube um, trays or egg cartons to separate your jewelry. Um, oftentimes, if you're someone who um, likes to put on jewelry, you're going into your jewelry box and you can't find a lot of those things. It's because they're not separate compartments. So having little separate compartments for those types of things will help you find them. Um, you know, taking um, the time to um, look at things like keeping a flashlight next to your bed as I mentioned, having a typical night, night lamp, nightstand um, lamp that you could do the clap on method. Maybe you have an app on your phone and you have an on or off. There's so many different kinds of devices nowadays. Uh, making sure that, you know, your shoes and slippers are close by. Um, you put them in the same space under your bed as well. And certainly keeping a nightlight. It's, it doesn't hurt to have a nightlight, especially um, along the areas that you walk commonly at night, whether it's to the bathroom, to your bed. 
Some of the other types of things, I mentioned a little bit about medication. So I wanna talk a little bit about medication. Um, that's also very important. With medication, oftentimes it's hard to see the pill, the pill, um, which differentiating the different pill boxes. Oftentimes people can start remembering that this pink round one versus the yellow one, um, there, one's my blood pressure medication and um, one is for, um, for another um, condition. But because sometimes the color contrast is only slightly, whereas maybe like 20 years ago, you could tell the difference between those that light, slightly yellow and that slightly pink pill. You may have difficulty telling those. Oftentimes you might rely on looking at the pill to see specifically what letters are on there and that tells you what the, the item is. Um, but that can become a problem. So medication management is another area that the occupational therapist can help you out with. There are, um, pill boxes that talk to you, that tell you what things are. Certainly asking your pharmacy whether or not they can increase the font on your um, labels is, is an easy thing you can do. Um, but being able to kind of have um, you know, a set situation where you establish where your pill box is, because we know you don't want to take two of one pill and not enough of another, because you can end up in a significant problem. So um, marking those distinctively, there's ways to mark those, whether it's using color-coded, um, brightly colored coded labels, maybe there's a circle on top of one of the caps, there's a triangle on another, and that's an easy way that you have a key that you can identify what those, what those pills are. Um, talking medication reminders and pill boxes, large um, pill print pill boxes, those are other common ways to be able to, to help you out with those medications that can become critical. Some of the other things that commonly um, individuals have issues with is in the kitchen. Um, you know, attaching lights to the underside. So if you have top cabinets, putting a light underneath. Maybe you always wanted a light underneath your cabinets. Well, this is a great excuse to do that. Um, you, you know, whether it's putting a bulb up underneath, there's a lot of, if you go to your local um, Home Depot or Lowell's or that type of um, home improvement store or your local hardware store, there are, sometimes even at the dollar store, um, there are magnetic lights, they're LED, so they're bright, and they use, they're usually circular, and they're push lights. So they have just their battery operated, you can stick them right underneath, and they're just a push light that you can push them on and push them off. That can illuminate your kitchen counters very well because if it's underneath the other cabinet, it doesn't do any damage because you don't have to screw anything in. Um, you don't need an electrician to come out and run a wire. Um, just something very simple for you to do is those little LEDs. You can also put those, uh, those um, um, lights in like closets or anywhere where you don't have enough lighting and you can just push them on when you go in. Other things for your kitchen cabinets is, um, you know, changing your hardware. So if your hardware kind of blends in, you have difficulty figure, figuring out where the hardware is, you know, if, if you're remodeling your kitchen or you want to do something simple, you can simply paint um, or change the hardware so that it contrasts against the cabinet doors. Other things like your stove dials, your microwave, um, this dishwasher, things like that as you have issues with contrast you may not be able to see the dials. So you may be um, oftentimes you, if you want to use the one minute button, two minute button, that kind of thing, you can easily do some types of labels and things like that. Those are other things that the occupational therapist can help you to be able to identify. Um, if you have a trouble and I said oh put a dot on there and you're thinking well I can't see the dots. There are bump dots that are slightly raised that you can learn by touch and by repetition to be able to identify those. Um, cutting boards. Oftentimes, um, I've been in individuals' homes or in even in like our short-term rehab at Del Air, and we have an individual that may have issues with or they don't they don't use their they don't cut they prepare their meals that way because they're nervous to use a cutting board and to cut themselves. So there are ways to be able to help and that's like colored if you're if you're cutting bread or something like that. Um, typically our cutting boards are white or clear um, and that might not be a good option. So getting a colored cutting board so that you can see that contrast will help out. There are also cutting boards that have grooves so that your um, knife can go along that groove as well so then that helps you with um, protecting yourself. Um, maybe you are a baker and now you have difficulty seeing the marks on your uh, measuring cups. There are ways to be able to do enhanced ones um, as well to be able to do that.
So that kind of gives you an idea. Oftentimes, um, just for time's sake, some of the things that just to, to help you guys out with, there's lots of things you can do in your home as well as recreation for and leisure. Things like um, larger print um, books are always available at your local library and institutions, as well as oftentimes there are reader programs where they have audio um, recorded books on tape um, that you can oftentimes if you look at your local libraries and organizations they do that there is things like audible or um, Kindle or those type of things where they're reading the book to you if that's something that's a passion that you love um, same thing with even bingo cards maybe you go to a local bingo and that's your favorite thing to do um, especially as we start opening up um, then having a larger bingo cards and things like that available for you could be an option so some organizations, just to kind of leave you with some resources, certainly finding your local occupational therapist, whether it be through an outpatient cl clinic, uh, therapy at home, or even at a short-term rehab center like Arista Care at Del Air can be an option for you. But there are other resources out there. Um, and again, depending on what your problem is, that occupational help therapist can help you adapt it. I gave you some very easy, simple little things, but there's so much more that can be done in your environment. And I'm sure I didn't cover half of the things that might be, you might be struggling with in your life. Um, so even for low vision aids, there are um, lease programs. So maybe you thought, oh, you know, I have a difficulty reading my bills or I want um, to be able to do that. And if you looked at things other than a basic magnifier that um, you have on your phone or a handheld magnifier, there are lease programs and they can connect you with those. Some of those organizations are maybe your local Lions Club. The local, um, your local Lions Club, one of their missions is really to help with low vision. So they have a lot of resources. Oftentimes they even um, work with some local occupational therapists or low vision therapists so that they can connect you with that. And often that can be done through um, some charitable organizations that they have affiliations with. Um, Lowvision.org, so L-O-W-V-I-S, ION.org um, provides alternate media for those that are visually impaired. And that can be reading radio, talking books, internet audio, um, Bibles um, on book, on, um, on tape, as well as large print books. The National Eye um, Institute is another resource. If you're looking for little gadgets to help your life or um, some of the things that we talked about, like maybe you need something specific for your medication or um, maybe you need it for um, just medical reminders or maybe you need a special um, glucometer so you can check your, um, your blood glucose levels for diabetes. Um, a lot of those type of products you can also purchase through lighthouse.org. Lighthouse International has been doing um, low vision and has lots of videos even for you at www.lighthouse, L-I-G-H-T-H-O-U-S-E dot org. They have lots of great videos that show you how to do some of those simple modifications yourself um, in your home. Um, other resources for you are allaboutvision.com is another great resource. But check out the things that you might have in your local area. Oftentimes there are a lot of um, organizations that are happy to be able to provide some resources and they may even have some of those um, devices and things on hand through a lending library that they have of uh, those devices. So again, my name is Michelle Hedegar. I'm an occupational therapist and program director with Aristocare at Del Air. Thank you for joining me today. I hope that I introduced you to some different ideas, some things you may have not thought about. Um, certainly understanding what is considered normal vision loss versus what may be considered a problem you definitely need to seek out help for. The most important thing is to get those regular eye exams so that you can identify things early. And there's no reason if you're struggling with something that you should be. There's always help out there. Um, so thank you very much and have a great day.